Today, I will focus on trading strategies. I'm going to focus on the advanced trading strategies. I'm not going to do the silver ones, buy and hold, and uh, some of the uh, insurance related options like CPPIs, and I'm not doing that. <coughs> I'm going to focus on some something more advanced. And again, you will see why. I will explain and justify my lecture of today as it develops. A lot of this is, is, is based on um, <clears throat> what we saw last week on what hedge funds are. Again, hedge fund is the general term that describes any investment fund. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be a mutual fund, it could be an ETF. Uh, the, the generic term is going to be a hedge fund. It's one that can go long and short and, and do uh, play leverage and, and things like that. That will become a clear today. And one um, interesting, I know you cannot read uh, the legend here. It's, there's too much stuff in this slide, but that's not a big deal. Uh, the reason I have this for you is the following. I have here different trading strategies in terms of what their um, uh, risk and return are on a, a scattergram. Hmm? So what we have is on the here is what we have is the uh, risk and here what we have is the return hmm? <clears throat> and as you can see some strategies here are you know they have a very high risk and a certain amount of return others have very re low return and very low risk and what's important to notice in this uh, chart is that this is all over the place hmm? This is all over the place. If you were to do something like this with more traditional investments, such as, for example, mutual funds or ETFs, you would see that they're all like in the same area. They, all, they will all be there. Mm -hmm. The level of diversification that we get from trade strategies of different types is going to be very high. And this is what, what makes them attractive. This is what makes them interesting to investors. <coughs> it's a good source of diversification. <coughs> what I want to... Uh, the perspective I'm going to approach today is going to be risk-based. And the reason is not because risk is interesting. It's not. Uh, well, not by itself. As I remind you one thing that I said last week, which is you cannot have performance unless you take, unless you take some risk. A pure bit trust does not exist. And what I want to do is I want to explain the return we will get from these strategies by understanding the risks that we're taking. Mm -hmm. I remind you of the snow fund we built last week. It seemed that it was a very good investment until we saw that we were taking credit risk for free. And then the whole fund was in danger and we could see that we could lose um, even the business, entire business, as well as investors' money because we did not take that into account. So I want to focus on that. And you will see that by having a perspective that is uh, focused on risk, we're going to understand, I think, fairly well how performance will follow. Mm -hmm. That equation is, is what works. I, Every time you get involved in designing a trading strategy of some sort, I always encourage you to think of the risk, which is what your input is. The uh, performance is the output. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the approach I'm going to be taking today. I'm going to start by... Um, so there's, there's a lot of strategies. And what I have here is the list of the strategies that hedge funds take. This is... Um, only a subset of all of the strategies that exist out there. Perhaps the one which is most uh, diverse and, and interesting, there will be even more. Uh, like, for example, here I have uh, long bias, okay, which I, I, I'll explain. <coughs> I have long only. Uh, um, long only is what, for example, mutual funds would do. But we're going to see that mutual funds have additional restrictions that we will not have if we have a portfolio which is long only, and we'll see examples of that. Hmm? So uh, what I have here is, is, is very advanced. I, I've skipped through some of the more basic trading strategies. Um, so don't assume that this is everything. This is just the most advanced 
uh, version. Okay, the most elementary one I just skipped. There is really nothing very interesting, in my opinion, to tell you at this point in time in the course. And what we have is some of them are, for example, based on convertible securities, which I will explain. Others are based on distressed situations, and I'll, ex I'll explain. I hope I can explain all of these. I don't know. Uh, if I run out of time, I'll just talk. <coughs> hmm? um, they, there's one that I'm not going to describe here, which is emerging markets. Emerging markets is a very interesting uh, strategy because essentially they are, the source of funds is, uh, or the risk that you're taking when you do that is, for example, liquidity risk is a, a very big issue. But on the other hand, you're providing liquidity to a market that has little liquidity and there's a liquidity premium that is given to you for doing that. These kinds of things I'm not going to um, include in this course. They are perhaps, given that have to be selective, they are less interesting for you, I think. But be aware that these other strategies that I'm not going to touch upon. Hmm? I will try to do as many of these as I can, but there's two that I want to do in great detail. Um, one is equity-based. Uh, it's going to, I will focus on equity market neutral. <coughs> you will see why. Um, much of what I will say here will apply to other equities, but then I'm going to focus a lot on convertible arbitrage. It's not a very big style, but what we will learn from there is very useful. So I use that as a learning uh, tactic more than something that you will be doing. I don't think any one of you will be doing convertible arbitrage, but what we will learn by doing convertible arbitrage is going to be very useful. I will use that as, for example, the way to tell you how Monte Carlo is used in trading strategies. And I could do Monte Carlo in any one of them, but in convertible arbitrage is particularly um, easy to understand. And that's why I will do it there. Okay? All right. So um, these are the strategies. I'm going to start with equities. Equities is stocks. You're going to be trading stocks. It's a very big style, uh, maybe 25% of all of the styles uh, trade equities and only equities. Mm -hmm. It is not unusual to find many other trading strategies, like for example, uh, convertible arbitrage, they will trade equities too. But equities and other things. This is the strategies that only trade equities, nothing more than equities. Many uh, labels uh, for the equity, but I'm not going to focus on that uh, today. I prefer to focus on the actual <coughs> process that goes into the creation of these trades. So um, on the long side, I will start talking about longs, then I'll talk about shorts. And then I'll talk about long short, and then, I'll do, then and from there, we'll just be able to cover a very large amount of territory. I'll start with equities. There is essentially five um, methods for trading stocks. <coughs> The first is, <clears throat> I'll describe this with some amount of detail. Fundamentally, in particular, I'll tell you what it is. This is what was generated at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, uh, what we called um, value investing, or what we call value investing. I think I described that to you uh, last week. And uh, this is going to analyze stocks almost from an accounting background. Mm? We just understand the value of a company from an accounting background. That's what fundamental does. Growth is different. Growth focuses more on the future, but as you will see, there are some rules to do growth trading. It's not just purely speculative that like, you know, I think, you know, Netflix is going to do great, or I think Microsoft is going to do great. There's some metrics that um, allow investors to quantify what that greatness means. And we will go through that in some detail. Then GARP is growth at a reasonable price. It's a style which is in between a growth and fundamental. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about that except to say that it's somewhere in the middle. Hmm? Uh, you use arguments from uh, fundamental and you use arguments from growth and then you put them together and that's what you end up with. Hmm? All right. Um, momentum is very interesting. You look for stocks that are moving significantly uh, with high uh, volume and they can be moving up or moving down. Usually it's a move up that investors like to uh, capture. Okay, so the um, best example of a momentum trade 
is GameStop. Mm? Uh, that was a very quick momentum. It lasted, what, a week? Mm? <coughs> and the, the reversal was very fast. It lasted about a day and there was over. Mm? But that momentum trade uh, is, or th that's an example of a momentum trade that investors uh, pursue. And the idea is to obtain gains, short-term gains, and you have to be alert at when to exit uh, those, um, those uh, momentum uh, trajectories because they, uh, when they revert, they typically revert very um, violently. And if you're not fast to exit those trades, then, then you can be in trouble. Um, despite GameStop that, you know, many of my colleagues may even disagree, may, may not even know what GameStop was. Um, the typical momentum trades that uh, people quote is Netflix in 2013. Hmm? And something very strange is even the CEO of Netflix recognized in public that Netflix was part of a momentum trade. CEOs don't like to recognize that or don't like to publicize that because basically it says that the stock is overvalued. Hmm? There's an implication that the stock is overvalued, which of course uh, any CEO would never say that the stock is overvalued. It's always undervalued, right? <clears throat> um, but in this case, even even he said that. Mm. However, I'll, I'll say one thing. <clears throat> one of the biggest momentum trades that I like to talk about these days is ESG. I consider ESG to be a momentum trade. We talked about ESG two weeks ago, remember? Or actually more than two weeks ago, a month ago. Hmm? <clears throat> Why? Because there's, there's this uh, social drive to, uh, to uh, be responsible investors and, and whatever reason, this is creating a, a, a very big momentum trade called ESG that maybe is here forever. Maybe it will turn one day. We don't know. Hmm? Uh, those are examples of momentum trades. They are typically socially driven um, uh, stocks or in this case portfolios and uh, they have no no fundamental perspective that makes sense, no growth reason to be there. This is just something short term. You just need to take advantage of that. So that's momentum trading and I'm not going to say anything about that style today. And the last one is technical. Uh, technical, I'll say something about this. This is interesting. Because technical was, it's been around for a long time. These are people that believe in numbers. Hmm? Uh, of course, I believe in numbers, but <laughs> not that numbers dictate direction, right? A typical uh, rule, for example, in, in technical analysis is if the market uh, drops 10% from the high, then it's going to, it drops more than 10% from the high, then it's going to break through that to the next resistance level, whatever that is. So that 10% is considered to be a magical number. Of course, if everybody believes that's true, then that would be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and not, not at the level of a, of a momentum trade, but the thing is that not many people believe in this. So these, are, these have hardly ever been self-fulfilling prophecies. However, people do come up with their own views as to what certain performance numbers imply in terms of future direction. Most uh, investors will recognize that markets are, are, are not driven by those numbers. They are driven by other numbers. For example, fundamental. They will be driven. If, you, if your company is um, has a very low PE ratio, as we will see, profit to equity, uh, sorry, uh, price to equity, then that company will have to go up, right? Independent of whatever happened with that 10% resistance level. Technical people, they don't have that approach. They they believe in those numbers. <clears throat> now, what's happening now is uh, this is turned with the uh, assistance of AI and machine learning. This is these techniques are uh, are being rewritten, where the rules are no longer done by humans, but they're done by machines. The thing is that I have nothing I can say about that because I don't, no one knows what these people, what these computers are doing. No one knows, right? But you can easily imagine that you can turn the old technical analysis rule book into a neural net, which is calibrated with, with, with history. And, but you already know how to do that. There's nothing I can teach you about that. I'll just leave it there as, as a footnote that technical analysis with the aid of neural networks could become something really interesting, but no one really knows at this point. <clears throat> So with that introduction, 
I will focus, I'll start with fundamental and I'll tell you how fundamental trading works. And I have, a kind of, I have a, an example here of um, uh, five stocks. They're all in the technology space. Mm -hmm. Technology stocks are very hard to analyze through fundamental analysis. You, anybody here follows uh, Warren Buffett, for example? You follow Warren Buffett? Okay, what does he think about technology stocks? He's not a big fan. Well, I, I doubt, I, he, he probably views Apple as a consumer, um, as a consumer uh, stock more than as a technology stock. And I would agree with that, by the way. Uh, the thing that with technology stocks are, are particularly dif uh, difficult to analyze from an accounting perspective. I mean, uh, who would think that Facebook was going to, they, they went on the IPO with the zero revenues or something like that. That will drive fundamental people crazy, right? So what are the metrics that they look at? I have some, some examples here. And by the way, everything that you have here is from a Google Finance. So all of this is accessible to anybody on your computer. Hmm? Uh, or Yahoo Finance or any one of that. So uh, let's focus on Apple for, for example here. Apple, uh, when I did this, um, I don't know when I did this, <coughs> the price was $147. <coughs> mm. Now, and that has an, an implied earnings per share. What is that? Uh, how good is your accounting, by the way? Is it good? Good accounting, yeah? No? Okay, so it I, accounting is good, okay? Accounting is good. I, I recommend that you you practice your accounting. So earnings is the net earnings that the company reports every quarter. Hmm? Is uh, basically the their income minus their expenses. And for Apple, that is about eight dollars per share. That means that this company is making approximately eight dollars for every hundred and forty-seven dollars of um, assets. That's a that's a that's a pretty good return. It's about six percent or something like that. So they look at that. They consider this to be real value for that firm. You have another um, quantity, which is the P/E ratio. That's the price to equity ratio. That means that the price of this stock is seventeen times the value of its equity. Hmm? What does that mean? The value of its equity. Well, would anybody pay more than one dollar for the equity of a company? Future. It's all about the future earnings. So you typically, um, the, for example, paying five times. And by the way, the the, the real re, the real answer to this is the Merton model that we saw last week. The Merton model uh, showed us that the value of a company, from Merton's perspective, is a lot higher than the equity because the free option to go bankrupt, right? So that is uh, already in the Merton model, we can see that the price of a company will be bigger than the, than the value of the equity. Mm -hmm. and, and it's all about the future. Uh, what, what is the, um, if, if you consider that the equity of a company is gonna grow at a particular uh, rate, which is gonna have the risk-free interest rate plus some premium, and then you discount the future cash flows, you will see that that number is always going to be bigger than the value of the equity. So that's what this column refers to. That's the ratio of the price of the, com of the company to the equity. Um, the price to sales, you know, how much, um, what's, uh, you can see here that the price to sales of, um, of Apple is a lot higher than Microsoft. That would, that would mean that from this perspective, Apple is more attractive than Microsoft, right? Cheaper, about three times cheaper, if you consider that to be relevant. Excuse me. All these microphones, when you sneeze, it can be very unpleasant, right? Sorry. Um, and then other, other uh, so uh, dividends, some, some investors focus on dividends, others uh, not. They just build dividends into something else that they're looking into, and, and so on and so forth. So this is what fundamental trading does. Basically, look at, I, I included these two, which are some of the three that matter. There's others. Uh, you may have heard, for example, net income. Um, it's slightly different from earnings, uh, from an accounting perspective, uh, or free cash flow. This is how much cash they are generating that they don't really need to fund their operations. Mm -hmm. Or EBITDA, uh, earnings before income tax and depreciation of assets. It's an accounting term that is considered to be a very good description of how much 
uh, free cash you have. Okay, how much money is there? So th these are examples, and, and there's more. I, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. More. Hmm? But these investors, that's what, they, that's what they look at. And depending on the company, they know whether, for example, for technology companies, is that more important than that? Or is something else? Or if you look at financial companies, where is the right perspective? This is a bit of an art to understand companies in which sector um, should be looked at with this or that metric. Uh, the, the, the earnings per share of a technology company can probably not be compared to the earnings per share of a construction company. They work in a completely different way and they, use, uh, they make use of their capital and their equity in completely different ways. Hmm? So this is part of the art of um, doing this and this deal. I'm not going to get into this. This is something which is, uh, well, this is a bottomless well. We could be here for a long time, but I, I just want to give you a, a glimpse of that. Growth has a different perspective, as you will see. Uh, it is more um, trying to get an understanding of what the future would look like, but looking at the past from a well, from, from a, well, for certain perspectives. One, for example, is historical growth strength. How steady you have been at making, um, at, at, at growing. Um, for example, what's the volatility? They don't like the volatility, but I could refer to the volatility of that. We're going to see other, other measures. Um, um, forward earnings. People made projections for their forward earnings. Uh, an example would be, for example, Netflix. If in 2013, I know it became a, mom a momentum stock, but if you look at it from a growth perspective, you can, you can, you will make some assumptions. What is their uh, market share? Basically, there was a monopoly at that time with Blockbuster being the leader. So, well, if they collect, say, 5% of the market share, given that their, uh, um, their cost of running the business is so low, right? So the cost, is there very low cost every piece of revenue goes directly to the bottom line you consider that to be a very good growth stock so at that point the netflix would become a growth stock although their revenues could look terrible and warren buffett may say i don't understand netflix i am not going to you know i, I just don't like any of these numbers you look into the future say yes but every dollar they make becomes um it goes right into their earnings because they have no costs in running the company for example, so this is how growth traders would look at companies. I have an example here of um, Microsoft in 2003. It's considered to be the, 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 the paradigmatic example of a growth trade, Microsoft in 2003. Um, you probably don't have a very good perspective of what Microsoft was in 2003. That was, um, that, was, um, uh, that was before the iPhone. That was uh, when people were, that was at the beginning of CDs, music CDs. So technology was something completely different from what it is now. And Microsoft at that time had one product, it was called Windows. And that's what they did, but, but it was in everybody's computer. Right, um, uh, the the Mac was 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 around. It's been around for a long time, but was not really as big of a of a of a of a product as it as it, as it is now. Right. So when you uh, uh, try to understand uh, the historical growth, for example, earnings per share growth, uh, you look at that earnings per share growth over time, and then you see that it is well above. 5%, which is considered to be a strong number. Hmm? So you would look at that. <clears throat> you see the five-year average annual sales growth is 15%, and the five-year annual earnings per share growth is 11%. Very strong numbers, much bigger than the 5%, which is considered to be the norm at that time. Okay, So this is, you tick that box, strong earnings growth. Then costs and revenue control. Uh, there, you can see that their uh, pre-tax profit margin has been um, uh, around 50% uh, for them. And I have this thing here, you cannot see. The industry's uh, average is about 26%, it's about twice 
the profit margin than the rest of the industry during this period of time. That's great. If you look at the projected earnings growth, here you're making projections, but again, the projections is you're going to grow computers at this rate, they're going to keep this market share at this rate and this and that. You're going to see that the um, um, five-year projected earnings growth is 11%, which is very big. Mm -hmm. and so just about every consideration for growth, Microsoft just satisfied very, very well back in 2003. And then the return on equity, uh, the return on equity is 16%, which is very high. The five-year average, this is the most recent, but the five-year average is 20%, okay? Whereas the, um, the industry average is about 13%, so almost, again, almost twice. So it looks at, as, at almost all these categories that you look at, Microsoft was doing like twice as well as anybody else. Hmm? And this makes it into a growth stock. Growth stocks are typically, yeah, it's, this is the technique which is very often used for, for technology companies. So that's it. I'm not going to get any more into this. Um, I, well, I'll remind you that GARP is, is a type of trade which is somewhere in between. All of these are trades which are very much based on accounting information of the company, whether the accounting now, whether the projection into the future. This is how these uh, trades work. This is how these trading styles work. Okay. Let me now talk about shorts. That's on the long side. I'm done with the long side. I'm going to talk about shorts now. And to explain the short selling, I need to explain. I don't think I have explained this, but now I forgot if I explain short selling in detail. I know we've talked about short selling. And I know I seem to remember you asked me very good questions when I did. And I don't know if I already covered this, but I covered it just in case because I forgot what I already told you two months ago. Hmm? The process of short selling a stock is completely different from the process of buying a stock. When you buy a stock, you go to your bank, your broker, uh, you buy the stock. They are the ones who have connections with the exchange and they buy it for you. And then that's it. You have the stock and you pay money for it. When you short sell a stock, it's not, it's not as if you want to buy a negative amount of stocks. Although from a mathematical perspective, it looks like that. But from an investment perspective, it's very different. What you're doing is you're actually borrowing someone else's stock. Okay, so when you want to short sell a stock, first you have to find the stock that you can borrow. Then you sell it and you collect cash and then you owe that stock to someone. And you do this through a broker. Okay, what's the difference? The difference is that the stock that you borrowed is not yours. When you buy stock, the stock is yours. When you borrow a stock, the stock is not yours. You just borrowed it. And in particular, if the person that you borrowed it from wants it back for whatever the reason, you have to return it. The analogy would be when you, if you can buy a car, you can borrow a car. If you buy a car, it's your car. Okay. Well, you can do all the damage to it. You can keep it in your driveway. You can do whatever you want with it. But if you're borrowing someone else's car, then there are restrictions as to what you can do with the car to the point that if you say you have to give it back, then you have to give it back. This is not like when you rent a car with Hertz or Avis, but you rent it for a month and it's yours. You cannot say, Oh, you have to return it now. Say, no, I have a contract. I, I can keep it. There's no such thing as a contract when, well, as, as a contract for, for ownership when you, or for even use of the stock when you, short sell it. And this has tremendous consequences. Tremendous, as we will see. Um, um, if the owner of the stock that you borrowed wants it back, you have to return it. Of course, if you do this through a big broker, they will not even bother you saying that you have to return it. What they do is they take someone else's stock, they sell it and then they give it back or they, or they swap. If you, if you have to have what's called the locate reference for the stock, if you need to know what stock number you actually borrow, they will just change that. So, well, you borrow this until this day, but then the owner wants it back, I give it back to him or her, then I borrow someone else's stock, then I sell that, I give it to you, and that's what they do. And all of this is behind the scenes. You don't get to see that. So for most of the time, this is just not an issue, unless there are not enough stocks to go around. In which case you will be forced, it's called a, a recall on the short, you will be forced to return it. You have to 
buy the stock with your money and then give it back. And as you can imagine, this doesn't happen when the stock is very cheap, right? This typically happens when the stock is very expensive and you're forced into lock in your losses when this happens. And this is what makes this style completely different from buying stock. You have no right to keep that position indefinitely. Yes. Can, can, the, can the lender record the stock anytime they want or do they have to? No, anytime, it? anytime, anytime. But that shows that it's just going to work then because if you anticipate the stock is going to first rise and then drop, then they will just always record when the when the stock price rises and then you would make, make uh, uh, Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. What happens is that typically not everybody does that recall. Not everybody. So there's always some, someone else that is happy to have the stocks. They invest it for the long term. Right? Many, many investors in the stock, they keep them for the long term. For, like, for example, pension plans, they may buy a stock and keep it for 10 years. Right? Not everybody not everybody buys for the short term. But if, if everybody did, then yes, that's exactly what happens. Yeah, this is exactly what happens. This is a risk. I have a, I have a good example here. And again, I, I forgot if I, if I showed you this example. Did I show you this? I don't think so. I may have made a reference to it. This is the example that I use to explain short selling. It's very good. It actually allows me to touch on some other points, which are also important when it comes to trading strategies. And that's the short squeeze of the Volkswagen stock in 2008. Okay. So let me spend some time telling you. I'm going to tell you lots of stories today, which will help you understand how these things actually work in, in real situations. <clears throat> Do you know the story of Volkswagen, how it was? Do you know the car, Volkswagen? Yes, everybody knows the car, Volkswagen. So um, Volkswagen um, was created in Germany, was created by, uh, by Hitler, and it was created in the simplest possible way, which is by appropriating the automobile division of another uh, automobile company called Porsche. Porsche is a, was the name of a family, a, it's a family that started in the late um, uh, 19th century with, uh, like most other car manufacturers, with agricultural equipment. The big thing before cars were a big business was to build tractors and combines and things like that. Okay, so Porsche was in that business. The Porsche family was in that business. Like we have here the Massey family. Have you heard the name Massey? Same thing. Okay, think of the Porsche family like the Massey family. Okay. Um, agricultural equipment, trucks, you know, and uh, <clears throat> industrial grade uh, automobiles. And then they started in, in automobile division, when, which came later. The idea that you could use the engine to get everybody's their own car, that was new. Uh, Henry Ford was one of the first ones to think that, right? Before that is, you know, you use the engine for trains or for, uh, you know, equipment, industrial equipment. <clears throat> so when they developed that, that was just before um, Hitler took over. Then Hitler just took it and changed the name, called it Volkswagen, which in German is like the car of the people or something like that. And that's it. And I'm told, I don't know the Porsche family, but I know people who know the Porsche family. And I'm told that there was um, a desire in the family to always get Volkswagen back at some point, somehow. Okay. <clears throat> and the time came in 2008. 2008, do you remember? That was the year of the big uh, recession. Yes? Okay. All right. So what, I'm, what you may not know is, or do you remember which companies went bankrupt at that time? Many companies went bankrupt. Of course, the best knowns are Bear. Well, Bear Stearns didn't go bankrupt. Uh, Lehman Brothers, that was the big, big, big bankruptcy. But major bankruptcies were General, Mo General Motors. That was bad. Okay, Chrysler was bad also. Ford didn't go bankrupt, but was close. All car manufacturers were in trouble. Why? We saw that with Goodrich uh, a few weeks ago, right? In a recession like that, people stopped buying cars. And I think we discussed, I think I told you that one number, which is the implied holding period for someone's car in the middle of 2008 was 28 years. If you look at car sales, so, well, if, if car sales continue at this pace forever, everybody's going to hold on to their car for 28 years. 28 years, car? No. It obviously cannot happen, right? <clears throat> but this was used by traders to short sell 
almost every car company. Okay, uh, very few car companies were not heavily shorted. It's interesting. One car company that was uh, not heavily shorted was uh, Volvo. You know Volvo, the car Volvo. Yeah. You know why? Because it was Swedish, and it was considered to be okay. Uh, it was interesting because Volvo was not Swedish, was owned by Renault, and Renault was short sold by everyone. In fact, at some point in 2008, you could buy all of Renault, the company, cheaper than Volvo. When in fact, one of the assets that Renault has was Volvo. You understand what I'm saying? So you could buy all of Renault. Yes. Negative equities, like no, no, uh, no, no, they, no, uh, sorry, uh, Renault negative equity, is that your question? No, if the trade is you could, you could, you could buy Renault, then uh, sell, um, sell Volvo at that valuation, pay all the debt of Renault and still have money left. Because uh, that would be an arbitrage opportunity if you could do it. You couldn't do it. But what I know some people did, actually we did that in our portfolio, uh, we actually were Short Volvo, long Renault. That was a trade. <laughs> it, it had to converge, right, at some point. And you know that Volvo is now Chinese, right? Gili owns Volvo now. It's, um, eventually was bought by Gili, a Chinese company. Anyway, back in 2008, car companies were just shorted by everybody. And so was Volkswagen. So let's look at the position that Volkswagen had on the books, on the market, sorry on Friday, October 24th, 2008. At the close that week, on fri uh, Friday, Porsche owned 42% of the company, minority shareholder. The state owned 20%. Hmm? And 13% of the stocks were on loan for shorts. That means that short sellers had borrowed and then sold about 13% of the shares of Volkswagen, which is okay because there is still a float of 25%. That means that it's 25% of the stocks which are still owned by the original shareholders. So this is what gives short sellers some comfort that if owners of the stock want to sell it, there still is 25% left. So the idea that you're going to be recalled on your loan, on your uh, stock loan is very low. You understand? Okay. This is something that short sellers always look at. Okay. By the way, one of the things that was quoted on Wall Street bets about GameStop is that um, Melvin Capital, who was shorting uh, GameStop had shorted more than 100%. I didn't bother to look, but you never do that. I mean, I <laughs> short sellers, oh, oops, S sorry. Um, sh short sellers always look at that number, always, always, always. I don't know anybody, anybody who short sells not looking at that number. Okay. I was told uh, that in, I didn't read it, but was told that in Wall Street Bets, you, remember, you know what I'm talking about, right? GameStop, you may have read the same thing in Wall Street Bets, that um, the, the shorting of GameStop before it went through the roof was very heavy. And uh, again, maybe it was, maybe there was some stupid trader somewhere. I, all the traders that go short, they always look at this. You never, never do a short without looking at this. You can be fried in, in a minute, okay? You can be fried even if you look at it as you're about to find out because this was on Friday. Then on Sunday, the CFO of Porsche made an announcement, public announcement. He said that Porsche had bought cash settled options on Volkswagen stock to the amount of 31.5% which will get them very close to 75% ownership, right? Part of their plan to take the company back. And of course, that year was very easy to do that because the, comp the, the stock was very, very cheap. Yeah? All right. So um, 
what do you think happened on Sunday? I'm talking about Sunday, okay? For Monday was a bloodbath, but what do you think happened on Sunday? So put yourself in this position, all right? You are a, you are a trader. Uh, traders always look at their positions Sunday, Saturdays, you know, middle of the night, four in the morning. They, they're all, they always have an alert system when something like this happens. We, we were in that trade too. So on Sunday, I had to look into these numbers because we had two shorts on, on, on Volkswagen. Mm -hmm. I, I know this. I lived through this. I, I can tell you lots of stories. Mm -hmm. So what happens here? Price probably can go up because there's a lot of demand. Stock. Well, the thing is that the price cannot go up on a Sunday. Well, not, not on a Sunday. No, no. I'm going day by day, almost hour by hour. I want you to understand all of this, right? And I want you to micro understand this. So you get a, this is what I want you to learn today, to understand the, the, the tiny details that are not written anywhere. Okay. You can always read the big details, but it's so what do you think happens on a Sunday? Like on Sunday, the futures will go up. Like futures are still closed on Sundays. Closed, yeah, yeah, yeah. They open. What time do futures markets open? They open Sunday night. Okay, uh, but the futures are in the big. Um, I don't think there's futures on the Volkswagen stock. What people did, the first. What is the first stock market to open in the whole world? It's in Israel. They actually open on Sundays, before Asia. Okay. Uh, so people were trying to figure out a way to trade. And there was some after hours trading. This is bilateral trade, which is I'll buy your Volkswagen stock. I actually don't have the price here, whatever it was. I'll buy it at a, you know, at a 30%, um, um, a premium. Okay. I, I, I know you, you have a stock. I just called you directly. I said, okay, let's do this deal. Okay. I send you a, an email and then you say yes. And I pay you 30%. And then we settle it on Monday. People on Sunday were already trying to, close some of their shorts. Okay. That's what you do. You see that there's big danger happening. When the market opened in Frankfurt at nine in the morning on Monday, the market opens at nine in Frankfurt. <clears throat> then what happened? Now your answer comes. To, okay. And why would the price go up? Two reasons because Porsche buying uh, a lot of stock and then also like no Porsche this Porsche was not buying stock Porsche had the options already like the option. so the yeah so this is important right we've seen options these options were not maturing on that Monday they would much I don't know when they were maturing on you know in a, maybe in, a, in three months or so I, I actually don't know I have to look it up uh, not too relevant on, on Monday is not relevant when the options, what you know is that these options will have to be exercised at some point and you know what happens. There's a big band somewhere who on the road, this trade, and that bank as part of writing this trade, you know what happens when you do a trade like this, right? You've bought some stocks, but you have to buy more. That's part of your hedging strategy, right? So you know there's a big bank somewhere that's going to be buying stocks systematically because they have to. That's their hedging strategy. We know that, right? Yeah? So someone is going to be um, uh, buying stocks on Monday and someone's going to buy more stocks. The bank has to buy more stocks. And that means that this 25% is going to vanish very quickly. So what do you do? If you are, if you are a short seller, yeah, you want to buy, buy, exactly. How much are you willing to pay? Now you don't know, right? How much are you willing to pay? Market um, at the open, market went up by, and not at the open, uh, maybe 200%, but it actually rose all the way to 300%. So if you are one of those uh, poor people like us uh, who had a short on Volkswagen, what do you do? You have to put a trade. What price? You want to buy it. You want to buy stock, right? Our position was not very big. That's why I was looking at this. I said, oh, this is a great story for my class. Otherwise, you know, it, we, I, I don't, we probably lost $20,000 out of a portfolio of 400 million or something. I don't know how much money we had at that time. It was not a, it was not a big thing for us, but it's interesting to watch. Now, how much price, how much you, you would you offer? Uh, anything 
anything more than 286 per share? Well, the things that you don't know, 286, right? So it so could have been a lot worse. It could have been like 1,000%. Then the vicious market price, you just want to cut the loss. Yeah, well, the things that you don't know, right? So you don't know. So you, I you know it's going to go up, so I want to return it back. I don't want to pay. Well, you, you're going to throw a bit. That's what you do, right? And then you know that when you throw a bit, you, 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 can, you can watch the bids and the asks. And you can see that the, the, the price, even before the open, is, still, is, is, is going up. Um, a a pre-market, you can have some trades. I'm sure the volume was very low, but there was probably some trading um, before the market. So your, your bid is not going to be filled. Let's say the, the stock was $100. I said, well, damn, I offer 120 <laughs> No one wants to sell for 120 Although the stock is at 100 That's 20% gain in a, in a minute. Mm -mm, not good enough. And then you have to change your bid. 150 Maybe you're lucky and you fill you know, half of your position, but then the other half is still there. Right? I say, oh, damn, 175 200 that's what you do. That's, you, you, you keep on giving bids that are not filled, then you close those and open new ones, higher and higher and higher. And then you, it's a chase for the price. And then maybe if you offer 300% at the open, maybe it gets filled immediately. But then if it only rises 200%, then you look like a fool. You actually lost an additional 100% on the trade. You see? You don't know what to do. You really do not know what to do. And how much money can you lose? being short, unlimited, unlimited, right? You can make your projection, so how, where, where will the price be? Well, it depends, because at this, at this time, it's not only the people who want to buy the stock back, it's the people who in 2008 sees one stock going up. When all of the others are going down, what do you do? You sell it. So, oh my God, <laughs> who would know I would make money on a car trade in 2008? You see what I mean? And anyway, so this is, um, this, it's a very interesting story. I, I, you, you may know that I teach a course like this. Actually, I teach this particular uh, example in Germany. And one of the exercises, one of the homework assignments I give to my students in Germany, I, I ask them to analyze the German stock market going back to 1990-something. But I have to tell them to remove Volkswagen from the data set because of this one day. That destroys the statistics that you try to do. We saw that last week, right? The impact of an outlier. We saw that, right? Well, in this, this is the outlier. It's uh, two weeks ago. It, it, no, last week. This outlier changes the statistic. If you do statistics of the German stock market with or without Volkswagen, the result is completely different. Do the variance, covariance, matrix, anything you want, it's completely off by that one event. It's huge, right? Huge. All right. So the lesson learned from here is that short selling has a lot more risk than buying stocks. I told you, we want to have a risk perspective because that changes everything. The risk perspective changes the way you act. It should, by the way. Hmm? So yes, shorting is great. A hedge fund hedges. If you are doing something, you hedge. And if hedging usually means you go short. Beware when you go short. And these things happen frequently. Almost every year, there's a short squeeze on something. Almost every year. Hmm? So let me, let me continue. I think you understand shorting now. So I can go into long short proper. Hmm? <coughs> By the way, there are, yes, yes. Well, the thing is, if, if you want to, if you do a short, then you're exposed to this risk. But let's say that uh, you have the option, the option, this, you have the alternative of buying a put. Okay. A put is typically a bit more expensive than uh, just going short. But then what's your risk of buying a put? You can lose a hundred percent of what you buy. Right. So because of that, um, this is part of the intelligence that people have as traders or portfolio managers or whatever you want to call it, <clears throat> is what is the effect that you're looking to achieve and how do you do it? So shorting may not always be the best option. Yeah. 
option. Maybe my input is, is, is better. Or not, because outputs are sold at a, at a premium, usually a very big premium. Mm -hmm. And then you say, well, you know what? I'd rather take my risk. But you don't know. It's a risk-based decision. Profitability is perhaps of secondary importance because uh, risk is the driver. We're going to see more examples of this, right? So you, you understand? Hmm? OK. By the way, there, there, is, there, is a, there is a hedge fund. They, well, I knew. I don't know if they're still in business, but there was a hedge fund. All they did was shorting stocks. That's all they do. And what they, it's three lawyers running that hedge fund. And what they do is every, every morning, they look at SEC filings. This is uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission. What they do every day is they somehow issue notes about companies that may be doing something wrong. They go through that. They look for dirt, right? And when they see, oh, this looks like this could have some consequence, look at the stock price, looks like it's not already discounted, then you short it, and then you move to the next filing. That's what they do. They only do shorts, right? Um, it's very risky from this, but if you are convinced that something bad is going to happen to that company, then, hmm? all right. All right, so let me, let me move on. What time is it? 12, okay. So here's a typical portfolio. I, I, I did this years ago. I don't, I don't know that the prices um, have anything to do with, uh, with the prices today, but let me show you a typical example of a long, short um, portfolio. You have some, so here we have is the, the value of my assets at the close, and you can see that they're all positive except three, that one, that one, and that one. These are my three shorts. I'm not gonna say anything about the longs, except that, you know, the, I got Apple, I got Bank of America, I got Citibank, I got the Dell Corporation, okay? Um, so I got some technology, I got some banks, I got some longs. So what are the shorts? I have Google as a short. Right? Look at the size. It's about 20%, 30% of the size of my lungs. That's what you would do. You don't want to take the risk of having, even, even for a company like Google that doesn't move 20% in a day, right? You don't want to have that risk because it could. Hmm? <clears throat> However, you have another one here. It's, this is very big. So what was the manager thinking? $14 million short. What was the manager thinking? That looks like a very big risk, right? No, you say no. Why not? It's the SPY. It's the SPY. What is the SPY? Tell us. It's not. That's the S&P 500, right? So this is the, this is the ETF of the S&P 500 index. So the S&P 500 index is not going to go up by 300% in one day. And the S&P 500 is not going to be taken over by any company, even Apple. Right? They can just take over. And so that's a very stable index. So yes, you can have that. That is, that's not going to move a lot more than a single stock. And we know also that this is the first eigenvalue of the covariance metrics. So it's also very stable. So that you can do. Okay, so this is okay. It's an index short. How about this one? That's very big too. What is that? That's the NASDAQ. This is the NASDAQ. That's the NASDAQ ETF, right? So it's also an interest. The NASDAQ ETF is not going to go up 300% in one day. It's more volatile than the S&P, right? But it doesn't go up. So in this portfolio, we have three types of uh, hedges. Sorry, three types of shorts. We have a single name short, and here you have to be careful. And these are broad market shorts. Those, those are okay, you can do that. Hmm? You're not exposed to that risk. If you, do, uh, if you do the net of this, of this portfolio, this net could be zero. Yeah, could be, I don't know. 
That means that you go long, you go short, so that the market goes up and down, you don't particularly care. Because your return is going to be coming from the difference between these stocks and these indices. Yeah? Or in other words, in mathematical language, the returns are going to come from the second and third and fourth eigenvalues, not from the first one. Right? Okay. Good. So, to understand this, to understand this, I'm going to show you an example. Let me ask you a question. Uh, how, how big do you think this uh, portfolio is? Let's say that this adds up to zero dollars. Does it mean that you could buy this portfolio if you don't have any money? No, you need some money. So this is the next thing that I want to do. I want to explain to you how you use money to trade. Very important. Very, very important. I'll, I'll do this example and then we'll take a break. Okay? I want to show you how you use money to do trades. And I'm going to use it a bit in reverse. I hope you understand what I'm trying to do here. Let's say that I have $1,000. And there's two stocks that I like. A, I like is great. And B, I don't like is bad. And I'm going to, uh, let's say that both are valued at 100. Say A is Apple, B is Microsoft. I don't know. Um, actually, a, 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 a trade that was a, a, a big trade was to go long Apple and short BlackBerry. It's not that this is where the A and B comes from, but imagine that trade, right? Um, so let's say that they're both at the same value, hundred dollars. Let's say BlackBerry is like no, it's it's over, and Apple is going through the roof. So I'm going to go long A and I'm going to go short B. And I'm going to do nine A's because I have a thousand dollars. So a hundred dollars per stock, I can do nine, right? I have enough money. And then I can do uh, 900 uh, short B also. That's the trade. Now, how do we finance this trade? That's the question I want to do. How much money do you need to do this trade? Well, if you are going to be doing this trade, let me start with this, what I call the conservative trade. Don't look at the other trades yet. Okay. Focus on this one. Let me do the trade as follows. I have $1,000, that's there. Then 9A is going to cost me 900. But 9B is going to give me 900. <clears throat> so my total balance is going to be $1,000 <clears throat> after I do the trade. Before and after the trade, my balance is the same. My cash balance is the same. My actual portfolio balance is very different because now I have 9As and 9 short Bs. Yeah? Let's say a year later, where's my balance? Let's say I was right and Apple went up by 10% and BlackBerry went up by 5%. Why was I right? I was right because my only thesis was that A was going to do better than B. Hmm? Great. So I was right. A did better than B. A rose by 10%, B rose by 5%. So my A is now 990 and my B is uh, negative 945. So I've made some money. Let's say I pay for my short selling. Remember, we have to pay for the short selling. Like when you borrow a car, you have to pay. I'm going to assume that you pay 1%. You typically pay 30 basis points. But let's say 1%. Because hmm? it's easier to use 1% in my calculations. That means that I have a net profit of $36, or in other words, 3.6%. Okay, let's analyze this trade. Who likes this trade? No one likes this trade. Why not? Let's analyze the return. Uh, sorry, who spoke? Oh, yeah. Oh. It doesn't? Okay, so um, I'll say one thing. You see, I'm assuming here rates are zero, right? Because $1,000 now is $1,000 in a year. So let's say that inflation is at 5%. Let's say that the interest rates are 5%. Then here I'll have $1,050. That means that my $36 is really $36 plus, I want to say LIBOR. By the way, today I'm going to talk about LIBOR too, if I have time. You know LIBOR is going away. 
Okay, so uh, June thirtieth is going away. Um, replaced by uh, over or something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but let's say you know this is plus LIBOR. So it's this is three point six percent in addition to risk free rate. So it's not so bad. It's not so bad, right? But when I say it's not so bad, what am I comparing it with? My snow fund that was giving me 7.2% after fees or 10% before fees. Maybe that's not a good comparison. So I compare with the market. What is the market doing? What's your best guess at what the S&P 500 did that year? 5%. Huh? 5%. No. Well, the average is not 5. The average is 7.5. Right? Yeah, so that would be my guess. The S&P went up by 7.5%. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, that's a good, it's, it's a guess. It's my best guess. I cannot guess better than this, right? 7.5%. So 7.5%, if I go to the S&P 500, and oops, sorry. 7.5%, if I go to the S&P 500, and 3.6% if I do this trade. Which one is better? 7.5 is better, you think? Okay, what if the stock A goes down by 5% and B goes down by 10%? I'm still right. I still, I, I didn't know the market was going to go up. That just happened, right? My only thesis is that A is better than B. I never said that A is going to go up and B is going to go up by less. I know A is better. It's very hard to predict. By the way, no one can predict if the market goes up or down. Okay, you talk to any investor, no one can predict that. So it's just that in my example, the market happened to go up. Let's say that it actually went down, but A goes up by 5% and B goes down by 10%. That means that my market is actually down 7.5%, right? Then how is that? My return is the same, by the way. This portfolio, my return is the same. So is this, do you like it now? You don't like it. You still don't like this trade. Market is down 7.5% and I'm up 3.6% and you don't like it? Is that what I understood? No? No, you like it? Yeah? No? Huh? I'm going somewhere with this, okay? Bear with me. Let's have this conversation. I'm going somewhere with this. And if someone says something in the chat, please read it to me because it's behind me. I cannot say anything. I cannot see anything. So, what we conclude from here is that the comparison of my return, 3.6, with the market is wrong. It's baseless, right? Why is it wrong? Because the risks that I'm taking are completely different. Back to our risk perspective. If the risk is different, why should the return be comparable? What should be the right way to compare this? Um, if we do a linear regression, I didn't have time to see linear regression last week, right? I skipped over it, but you already know linear regression, I hope. So if, if you know linear regression, and let's say you have a time series of this portfolio and a time series of that port of the index, what's the alpha and what's the beta? Let's go to the beta first. Beta should be easier. What's the beta? Do you understand my question? If you did a linear regression of my portfolio with the market, what's the alpha and what's the beta? What are you finding alpha and beta at? The linear regression. So if I have my, let's say this is my portfolio, pi, and this one is my S&P index, i. So if I write a linear regression, I will get this plus alpha. That's linear regression, yes? Okay. And I do this, imagine I have a time series. What is your guess as to the beta and the alpha of this trade? Hmm? The, the beta, you think, what do you think the beta is? You say it's positive, how much? It's one, uh, one half, maybe. One half? I would say zero. I mean, I don't know. The, let's say that, again, reasonable assumptions, right? I haven't told you what A and B is. 
But if A has a beta of one to the market and B has a beta of one to the market, which is a reasonable assumption, then long A short B has a beta of zero. This is a, this is a what's called a market neutral portfolio or a beta neutral portfolio, if indeed the betas are the same. You know that in the stock market, you have high beta stocks and low beta stocks. Hmm? These are stocks that move much more than the market and stocks that move much less than the market on a, on an average basis, right? But most stocks will have a beta close to one. They move with the market. Since I have no more information, I'm going to assume that alpha and beta, sorry, I'm going to assume that A and B have the same beta to the market. So it's a reasonable assumption to assume that the beta is zero to the market. Hmm? You understand what I'm saying? You also understand that I don't have enough information in my example here to calculate this. But if I gave you a data set, you could do that yourselves. Yeah? Okay. Good. So the beta of this portfolio would be zero. Expressing the fact that there's no relationship between the risk of my portfolio and the risk of the market. That's what beta equals zero means. If beta was 10%, then that would be, that would say that my portfolio has 10% of its risk coming from the market. But if the beta is zero, my portfolio has 0% risk coming from the market. Yes? Now, are you learning how to think this way? I want you to learn how to think. This is, I'm doing additions. I'm not even doing divisions. Okay? This is very simple. This is elementary school math, but applied in a very sophisticated and interesting situation. So is it clear to everybody that beta is zero? Yeah? How about alpha? I believe it's positive. Alpha is, will be positive if this portfolio manager is smart and will be negative if he's dumb, right? Alpha measures the intelligence of the portfolio manager. Is the portfolio manager IQ? You understand? Yeah? So when you're out there, uh, let's say that you're gonna invest in a mutual fund, okay? Uh, how, how do you determine which mutual fund you wanna invest in? Well, maybe you invest in a mutual fund because you want exposure to the market, in which case, well, good then pick the one that you like. But let's say you want to figure out who is the best IQ, mutual fund. Understand what I'm saying? How would you do that? Take the mutual fund returns, do a linear regression to the index, and look at the alpha, and that'll give you the IQ. That doesn't mean that the one with the highest IQ is the one that you want to invest in, because maybe you don't want that beta. There's other things coming with that but a way to analyze the skill of a particular portfolio manager or group of portfolio managers would be looking at the alpha. The alpha is a good description of the IQ, don't you think? You see that? Okay, great. Do you, do, do you, how do you think investors invest? In, I'm talking mutual funds now. They look for the best IQ. There's a very interesting uh, portfolio management strategy. I invite you to, to test it. And if you do it, let me know of the result. I would like to get an updated result of that. As follows, you take all the mutual funds, pick a country, Canada, the US, I don't care. Hmm? Take all the mutual funds. And then um, at the end of every year, you make two investments. You have two portfolios, right? One in one portfolio, what you do is you invest in the best performing mutual fund that year. That's portfolio one. And then portfolio two is at the end of every year, you invest in the worst performing mutual fund that year. Yeah? Okay, there's portfolio one, portfolio two. Portfolio one, invest in the best. Portfolio two, invest in the worst. Which one do you think does better over time? I encourage you to do this exercise if you have nothing to do on a Sunday afternoon, okay? And then if you do that, you send me the result. I'm very... What, what do you mean by best? Like, by best, the one that does better over time. Okay, so let's say I give you a database. I give you a database of all of the mutual fund returns of Canada since the year 2000. That's 23 years of return. 
And then you're going to build a portfolio that every year at the end of the year makes an investment. Portfolio one, invest in the best fund that year. Portfolio two, invest in the worst fund that year. Portfolio two, that's better, significantly better. Okay. So why is three? Hmm? Well, you can argue many ways. Uh, the typical argument is that a lot of these, um, a lot of these uh, <coughs> numbers are not exactly uh, random. If it was random, they would, who knows, they would be the same, right? It's just that sometimes some, some does it better for whatever the reason, but then that corrects itself the next year, right? That's what it does. Um, um, so you can hypothesize as to what that is. This is only related, marginally related to what I'm saying here. What I'm saying here is that <clears throat> if you want to pick a, a, a good uh, fund, you don't just look at one number that returned that year. You would look at the alpha. The alpha is a better description of how good that is. Because now you can do the same exercise I just told you, and every year you invest in the one with the best alpha. That's portfolio one, and portfolio two will be you invest in the one with the worst alpha. Right? And there, yes, the one with the best alpha wins. You, you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so alpha is a good description of the IQ, and you can, well, we're going to be with this for a while. This is going to, this, this thing that I just told you about alphas and betas will be with us forever. Okay, it doesn't matter if we then look at global macro trading or merger arbitrage, that's always there. I need you to understand always in terms of us, alphas and betas. Alpha is pure return. Whereas beta is just market exposure. And that's really the risk that's given to you. Mm -hmm. um, if your beta is one and you did very well in your port, if you, you could have the situation where the, you can have a portfolio, not these ones, okay, but you could have a portfolio where beta is one and alpha is zero. That means that you're just doing what the market does, right? How much should you pay someone who has a beta equal to one and an alpha equal to zero? What should the salary of that person be? Zero. Why would you pay for something that you can get from the market for free? Right? You understand? Goes back to the, I forgot who was doing, uh, who were my traders last week when I did the trading exercise? Someone was doing alphas and betas. I forgot who that was. I forgot. Anyway, that, that's okay. That's okay. But th this is related to what we did last week, right? One was paid a million dollars if you make 5%. That's alpha. And one was paid a million dollars if you give me the S&P returns plus 5%. That's alpha plus. That was you, right? Yeah. So that was your job, right? So I still pay you for alpha. I always pay for alpha. And paying for beta is not a good idea because beta is free. Anybody can give you beta, it's free. Go to your local branch, you know, go to any corner of any, uh, any street in Toronto and you find beta for free. Yeah? Okay, good, so we're done with the first trade. I think we understand the first trade very well. Okay, so let me move on because now, obviously, as you all know, this trade, I didn't need the $1,000 because I, I get $900 when I short sell B. So I can do this with $900, right? There's no problem. If I do this with $900, um, I still have a $500 balance before my trade. And the 36 the $36 I make at the end of the year, which is exactly the same as untouched, now becomes 7.2%, right? Great, so same question as before. Uh, who prefers this versus the market? The market is doing 7.5%. How do you compare these two? If you look at the, the risks, well, like here you're kind of very exposed to these two stocks, but like if you could, you could be very wrong about B and then maybe you'd be very bad. And the market is, you know, it's uh, less volatile, like you're not gonna lose like 5% probably. So, so maybe you got lucky or maybe you're smart, but besides that, your risk here is still beta of zero compared to the market, and your return is the same, right? So if this is sustainable, this is fantastic, <laughs> right? And in any case, your return 
is comparable to this to the market return is comparable to the market return and your risk is much lower so this is very attractive as an investment very attractive you see which one will you do that one or that one that's my next question we know that um, in a certain sense this is also better than the market totally different but this is clearly as good as the market no matter what perspective you have but now between these two which one do you like What's your preference? Well, it depends on how much money I have. Right? If I only have 500, then it's the second one. Well, it, 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 no, no it's, no, it's a good point. It's a good point. Um, it, and actually, let, let me turn the example around. Let's say you, you have $1,000, right? You, sh you have $1,000, right? Okay, yeah. so you have $1,000. Then what I can do is I can rewrite this example. And that's how I want you to think about this. Because I can rewrite this example and say, well, you know what? I have $1,000. So instead of by nine, I buy 18 and I short 18. Okay, you, double. Yeah. you double, right? So if you have a thousand, then that's a thousand, and then you double. Your return is the same. Now you make $72, but the return is 7.2. Okay. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. The, but the reason I, the reason I want you to think of this as exactly the same is because what we're talking about here is we're talking about cash management. Well, okay. Uh, for, for a mutual fund, by the way, you don't have to make this decision. A mutual fund is obligated by law to invest all of their money. So if you have that much money, there's no question. You have to invest all the money. Okay? But f mutual funds cannot go short. So they have no income coming from short proceeds. So they just invest and there's no considerations for cash management. No considerations. But here, yes, you can invest more, you can invest less. It's your decision. You can take but it's too leveraged. I think. Yes? This portfolio is too leveraged. I could call it. You think it's too leveraged? Okay, so you're, okay, so leverage means, well, would you, he says that this portfolio is leveraged. That's what you're saying, right? Yes. Okay. Let, let me, let me ask why. What do you think is, I'm, I'm going to have an interesting argument with him. Please follow. Okay. What do you think this portfolio is leveraged? Uh, well, I'm, I'm not borrowing money from anybody, am I? Leverage is when you borrow to invest. Um, I'm not, I, I have no intention of beating you, of beating you in any way, okay? I'm I just want to have a conversation. I'm trying to, I'm trying to spot you this. Um, well, I mean, well, I didn't go through this very thorough, but I just feel like I think I'm playing with more money than I actually have in my, in my pocket. Explain that. I don't see that. Because I have, let's say, the 1,000 example, so I have $1,000 in my disposal, but then I have about um, $1,800 yeah. in the, in, on the table. And yeah. that 1800 just vanished. And then right. I it, I no, but I, 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 I let, let me disagree with you. Okay, okay. Let me disagree. This is getting interesting. Yeah, really. You see, I have 1800 on the table, right? Well, yes, so what? But I mean, 900 of that is coming, or 1800 is coming from my short selling of my stock B. So I already have that, right? right. That's that's my money too. Why why not invest it? Shall I keep it in, in, in the bank or shall I invest that money? And by the way, this is what Silicon Valley Bank did, right? They got some money and they invested it. Is that leverage? Well, that money is not yours, right? The money that you sell. It is mine. Uh, when I short sell the stock, the money is mine. But you still owe the, the, the... I owe, I owe the stock. Yes, it is true. I owe the stock. So, so that's the source of leverage. That's, that's... Okay. So this is what happens. The, def the definition of leverage is very, very tricky. In fact, my answer to your question, my real answer, I, I wanted to have this conversation. My real answer is that the, the, you can define leverage in many different ways. And accounting typically has only one definition of leverage, which I don't think is very, is very rich. You need more definitions of leverage. And really leverage, what it is, is, is an expression of what leverage, leverage matters when it has risks associated with it. So leverage is a measure of risk. And now if leverage is a measure of risk, then what is the leverage here? I'm not gonna answer this question yet. I need to show you the next slide before I answer. But your point is a very good point. You can say that this is leverage, but then I could say that this is leverage too.
the difference is the capital required. I think you have enough. To oh, no, 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 no. I'm coming to the capital requirement in the next slide, right? But you see, here I have, look at this. I have $1,800 of exposure, as you said, but I only have $1,000. I'm arguing with you. Yeah. I'm wrong, by the way. But okay. But this is very tricky. And you need to have very good definitions of leverage. Now, Daniel. Yeah, so I think the, the problem is well, let's say A stays the same, but then B goes down. So yeah. let's say you have to if if your short is recalled and you have a loss on B. B goes B goes up. That's what you're saying. Uh, oh yeah, but B goes up. B goes up, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're dyslexic like me. I owe capital, but if, even if you sell A you don't have enough. Yeah. So you need to get it from somewhere else and if you can you have to borrow from the bank. So, uh, okay, so the thing is that there's leverage, depending on your definition of leverage, okay, accounting leverage, there's probably, you can say there's leverage everywhere. The situation is about to turn more interesting now, okay? So this, this conversation will get now even violent, maybe, we will go here. So because now let me argue that I need no money, right? Or I can do a billion long A's and a billion short B's. Depends on your preference if I have $1,000, right? Because after all, I short my B, I go long A, I don't need any money. My return is $36, but now since I invested no money, it's infinity. Right? I don't think this is going to work. They will ask you to put money. Wait, 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 wait. You're going too fast. You said that this is not going to work. By the way, you're right. This is not going to work today. But let me tell you a case when this happened. Now, uh, I'm gonna, what I'm going to tell you is not, is not accurate. It's not that it's not true. It's not accurate. Okay? I'm going to use a bit of a a poetic liberty to exaggerate some thing that actually happened in 1998 only so you make my point or sorry only so you get my point you understand what i'm saying okay so i'm going to exaggerate a little bit i'm going to explain what happened to long-term capital management in 1998. do you know long-term capital management have you heard that name i thought you meant bankrupt you have bankrupt <laughs> Did they go bankrupt or something? There was a scandal. Well, I don't think they went bankrupt. They lost a lot of their money or almost all of their money. It was a bit of a scandal because they were taking uh, very highly leveraged positions on, on fixed income securities. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a way to describe what happened to them. This is inexact. Okay. So this is. You, I'm showing you this example so you understand what I'm saying. There was a person by the name John Merriweather, who was the very popular fixed income trader, okay, that went around. They had a very good strategy. The strategy was fantastic. It was very good. They would be um, a buying, um, they were doing trades between um, a, 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 what's called on the run bonds and off the run bonds. On the run bonds are bonds which are traded. Uh, very actively by the market. Hmm? And then there's off the run bonds, which are trading very inactively by the market. And usually there's a price difference between the two, right? Uh, <clears throat> so depending on the particular situations, the, let's say the on the run, uh, bonds, uh, would be, uh, I forget the exact uh, the direction, but let's say the, the A would be the under run and B would be the other run bonds. Hmm? Do you do that? And you know that it's not a point of whether they will have different performance. You know they're going to have different performance. You know they're all going to converge because one is a 29-year bond and the other one is a 30-year bond. Right? So you just wait 30 years and you're going to make that differential for free. Guaranteed. See what I mean? It's like trading stocks but better. Here, no one guarantees that A is going to do better than B. Maybe Microsoft comes and they buy B and then pff, you're screwed, right? In this case, these bonds are there and they're going to collect, you're just going to collect it, you just wait. It's a great way of, of making money. That was their trade, right? Now, the thing is that if you do that, you need 
leverage because if you buy full price for these bonds, then the differential is so small that your return will be positive, but very small. So you want to use leverage. You want to do a strategy like this with very little money for that trade. So you can do a lot of them and then your return ends up being very good. You understand what I'm saying? You understand the analogy and why this is a metaphor? It's not exactly a stock, it's a one, right? So in 1997, you go around uh, Wall Street and you talk to, you go to a bank and you say, I want to do this trade. And then the bank looks at the trade and says, this is great. Oh, I love this trade. The bank loves this. This is very good money for the bank. You understand? That's why the bank does this. We like that, but no one talked about that. This is the banking business. This is great money for the bank. And the bank wants you to do business with them because this $9 is essentially for free. Right? Okay, so you go and then the bank is very happy. So this is great. Yeah, let's do, let's do this trade. I'll give you. And they say, okay, let's go ahead and do it. It was about giving me some money. No, 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 it's okay. I want to do this without money. I already have the money here. Let's just do the trade. And then the bank will say, but I cannot do this. And then the trader will say, oh, you don't want to do this? Then I'll go to another bank and you know that someone is going to give me this deal. Understand what I'm saying? And then the bank says, oh my God, no, 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 please don't go. These $9 are wonderful for me. I, please stay. I'll figure it out. I'll, Okay, and if you have reputation with the bank, they may allow you to do it, right? And that happened, that happened. You could trade with, I mean, of course it wasn't zero, but it was epsilon, yes? That happened. It happened not just with one bank, but with many banks. In fact, you went, you went to a lot of banks and then you have this deal with them. And I forgot the exact numbers, but I it's something like this, five billion of capital led to more than one trillion of uh, notional. This is big. One trillion in 1998 is a lot of money. Now it's less money. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve um, balance sheet is now huge. In 1980, it was much smaller, okay? But it, still, one trillion is a lot of money. It's a lot of money. And what happened is at the beginning of August, there were two events that happened the same week. One was the the Monica Lewinsky example, uh, scandal, you heard that? Yeah, with Bill Clinton got impeached in Congress and the Russian default, the famous Russian default of 1998. So that drove markets into a, into a, a tailspin and the trade reversed. In, in, you, in this language, A went down and B went up. You can say, I don't care, I wait my 30 years and then you're gonna make the money, right? Yeah, you could do that. You could wait the 30 years, except your balance here is so negative now that in 30 years, you'll be very positive, but your balance is so negative now that eventually the banks could not hold it anymore. And they had to call the Fed and they had to do a, a, a manicured redemption of this portfolio because it was huge, it was huge. So in 1997, you could do this, you could do this. But then uh, this was a, a, this was corrected with Basel II. I, I gave you the history of risk management a few weeks ago, and I told you what happened with Basel 1998. This was the reason why Basel II was enacted. This example, it's a bit of a metaphor. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you understand what I'm saying, yes? Okay, so the net result is that now, if you want to do this deal, this cannot be done. The banks could do this, but they have to pay for the capital in their own way. This gives rise to risk capital that we see that we saw three weeks ago. Someone has to pay for that risk capital. Okay, the bank wants to pay for it. Great. Typically, they don't. Why would they use their risk capital? The nine dollars doesn't justify it anymore. So you have to have risk capital, and this is how it works. This is the next, this is how things work. So I'm giving you an example of, I'm explaining to you now what trade margining is. Trade margining is what you have to put down to do a trade. When you buy a house, you have to put 20% down. The rest you can mortgage. If you don't do that, you have to pay mortgage insurance. This is something similar. When you do a trade, how much money do you need? So this is a rule. 
This is a typical rule. You can do better than this, okay? But this is a typical rule. Um, long positions require 50% of the collateral. Short positions require 80% of the collateral. So, sorry. Long positions require a collateral of 50% of the value, and short positions require a collateral of 80% of the value. Okay? So the bank will say, oh, you want to do that deal? Yes. So this is the calculation. You need, for long A, I need $450. For short B, I need $720. Altogether, I need $1,170. Since you get $900 from selling B, you need $270. Okay, so the answer is here. You can do that trade with a thousand, yes, with 500, yes, even with 270. You cannot do it with 269. Okay, or if you have a thousand dollars and you want to put a thousand dollars to this trade, then you could go as high as buying 36 A's and certain 36 B's or something like that. Understand? This is what's called portfolio sizing, and this is this is very interesting because this is part of how you manage your cash. This is cash management. Yeah? Now, uh, let me ask you a question. Who, who here would do this straight? Oh, by the way, the return with this is 17%. Whoa. So there's three trades that we can do here. The trade with, so the trade with zero we cannot do. But we can do a trade with $1,000, a trade with $500, and a trade with $270. Let me take a vote here. What trade do you like? And the ones on Zoom also answer, please. Who here would do a trade? Raise your hand if you would do the trade with $270. Three people. So I forgot the options. $270? And then $500 and $1,000. Look at the numbers, okay? $270. 500 and 1,000, yeah? yeah? Great, you're, you're all traders now. You're all managing money. You have to make a decision. Not raising your hand is not an answer, okay? Not raising your hand is not an answer. So who does it with $270? Wow, okay, I can see that you all took APM 466. Good, good, good. Who will do it with $500? Okay, and who would do it with $100? Sorry, with $1,000. No one will do it with $1,000. Okay, great. So let me tell you something. Uh, the people who uh, did it with 270, raise your hand again. On August 13, 2007, the following thing happened. That was 2007, that was the year of the, of the, uh, that was not Lehman Brothers, that was 2008. Uh, the example of Volkswagen was 2008. That was before that. That was the year when the subprime crisis was beginning to boil. Right? So um, there is a rumor that a very big bank, like for example Goldman Sachs, had a very large redemption order. Their investors were nervous and they wanted to sell their positions. They wanted cash. So Goldman Sachs had to sell billions and billions of dollars of securities to give it back to their investors. So they picked the day when nothing major was happening in the market. You look at that day, nothing happened. It was, okay? But then you look at certain securities A and certain securities B, and they did horrible, horrible. A lot of Bs went up by a long margin, and a lot of As went down. Why? Let's say I was Goldman Sachs, right? I'm long. A, I'm on short B, and I have to give billions of dollars to my investors. What do I have to do? I have to sell my A's and buy back some B's to get cash, and I give it back. Right? Okay, and I do that in big numbers. Turns out that we all went to the same APM 466 course. We all bought the same A's, and we all shorted the same B's. What happens that day that I sell my A's and, and cover my B's? What happens? What happens? I'm selling A's and I'm buying B's. The capital from somewhere else. No, no, I'm selling my A's. So what happens is that the price of A goes down and the price of B goes up, right? Okay, when that happens, what happens to your margin? Violet, right? 
Yeah, so Violet gets a phone call. Sorry? What's your name? Violet. Oh, I was right. Okay, so Violet, I call you. I said, hey, your balance is negative here. So you have to give me some money. What do you do? I go bankrupt. What? <laughs> what? I didn't hear you. You no 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 you don't go no you don't go bankrupt. Not yet, not yet. You repeat the cycle. No, what you do is you have to sell A's and buy B's, right? That's it. Uh, so you have to you know unwind. When you do that, what happens to A and B? A goes further down and B goes further up. Okay, who else rose, rose their hand? I'm going to go through everybody who rose their hand. Did you, you rose your hand, right? You also did 270, yes? So you're, the, and what's your name? Yanti. Yeah, that's right. So I get a, I, I call you, I said, hey, your balance is negative here. You, you, you need to sell more A's, buy more B's. Yes? What do you do? So you do that. I'll have to do it then, right? Sorry? After sell more A's. After? I was after sell more A's, no? I, ha I don't understand. Like, like, you have to sell A's and you buy B's, okay, at a loss, okay, so you lose money, you lose money, and everybody who was at 270, your balance is now negative, you're going to lose money, right? Yeah? I could go through all of you. And so who said he would, uh, you would do this with $500? You said $500. So Daniel, what do you do with... Well, they've been asked for... Uh more capital you can just if you believe like in the mission position you can just give them more uh to meet the capital requirement. what you would do is you would call the broker you call me i'm the broker also say what the hell is going on right and then i said i don't have time to talk to you i'm very busy giving margin calls and then you think oh i know violet yeah she was in my class i'm sure she got caught in this trade. she's a risk taker you know she's right then you know exactly what's happening and then you wait you do nothing today, you wait until tomorrow. Then tomorrow, yes, tomorrow you maybe increase your position. You go from $500 down to maybe 400 because you are risk averse, right? You don't like risk. But at that price, maybe you do. Then it bounces back, then you're ready, and then you make a bit more money. You understand? This actually happened too. In this case, the banks were not at risk. That was not the issue. But the thing is that if, you, if, you, if you're, or no, I'm exaggerating, you know that, right? I mean. 270, I tricked you. I tricked you into the 270 because I didn't show you that 270 is very risky. Any movement down will create a margin call, which is lethal if you have a position like this because you have to start to unwind, right? Maybe I can explain why I chose that. I thought you could just cash out your return after you cash. Yes, you can cash out by selling this. You have all your money is in securities, right? Yeah, I mean, once I collect that initial 100 something, and then I'm, I'm just out. See, the thing is, yeah, so uh, when you're investing, if you invest all of your money in this, you have no more cash. It's not like you call your investors and ask for money. You, you cannot call your father and ask for money, right? That doesn't exist. This, all of this has to be done within the fund. Hmm? So if, you all, if all of your money is in securities and something happens, the money has to come from these securities. And your balance of 270 in cash <clears throat> it's not enough because the broker will not allow you to touch it. That is your collateral that you have to have there. You understand? Great. Um, actually, what I have here is I have the, the probability of a margin call. You can actually calculate this assuming Gaussian returns. I'm not going to spend any. I spent already more time on this than I was planning to. But you have to speak very slowly and loud because this is a huge classroom and you don't have a mic like me. Uh, so the problem here is that after A goes down and B goes up, um, our cash like value goes into negative. That's right. And therefore, we have to do the selling A to buy that B. Right. So if you have five hundred, that means you're like somewhat you're not in the very negative, like you're not in the negative. So, then, so mm -hmm. then you don't have to do the um, selling A and buy. Correct. Them. Correct. So and if A goes like very, very down and oh. very, very up, then everyone goes negative. Absolutely. If, if it goes very, very down and B goes very, very up, even with $500, you'll be at risk. Maybe even with $1,000, you'll be at risk. But just like that, 270, 270 is just the point at which if you go into this formula and you calculate the probability of a margin call is 100%. Okay. So you picked a trade that has a 100% chance of 
creating a margin call. Margin call does not mean you're bankrupt, but your business is over, typically. Because you lose 20% in one day. That's what many of these funds did, lose 20% in one day, and then 20% in one day, your investors will walk away from you. Right? Yes? Is it uh, viable to model this using a Gaussian distribution? Is it viable to? Like to model it using Gaussian distribution? Well, it's what I could do. Pick your distribution, you can model it differently. Yes. It, 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 it's better than nothing, but it's worse than many other things. Yeah. The, the advantage of the Gaussian distribution is that I can use the reflection principle. Right. Here, what, you, what you're doing is you're calculating, it's a very interesting distribution, which is you're calculating the distribution for the maximum of Brownian motion. The thing is that the, to calculate the, the distribution of the maximum of a random walk is difficult. But in the case of the, of the Brownian motion, because of the reflection principle, you can actually calculate it and it has an explicit formula. If you give me a, a, another process, maybe I cannot do it. But with the Gaussian, I can do it. It's right there. But anyway, if in the Gaussian world, your probability of a margin call is 100%, it's not a good trade. <laughs> yeah. OK? All right, so we have seen a lot of things. And, and you notice that what we have seen, in fact, I used the example of long-term capital management, what we have seen could be used in situations that go beyond equities, right? I used equities, long and short, and this and the, but this what you've learned, you've learned lots of things about leverage. We've learned about margin calls, about margin requirements. This applies to all other securities. Hmm? We're going to take a break now, I take a 10 minute break. I spent more time than I planned on this. And I still want to do one more style, which is convertible arbitrage. The other side, I don't care. But convertible arbitrage, I do want to do. I will do that in 10 minutes after a break. So I'm going to talk now about convertible arbitrage. And as I mentioned, as I said earlier, this is not so much about convertible arbitrage as it is about a, a type of thinking that goes into into this. I'm going to I'm going to use this as a way to explain how to use scenario generation, how to use Monte Carlo, and how to to to, to learn about uh, uh, trades. If we used if I used equity long short to explain margin in and leverage and all of that. Now I'm going to use this as a way to explain Monte Carlo, which of course is good for everything, including stock trade. But I want to do it in the context of a convertible bond. So convertible bonds are securities which companies with bad credit uh, issue. If you have good credit, you can just, and you need money, you borrow issuing bonds or taking loans. If your credit is not uh, so good, that's not going to work, and you may resort, have to resort to issuing stock. But sometimes even that doesn't work. And if some issuing stock doesn't work either, then you have to resort to a third type of security, which has, for the investors, the best thing that bonds have, which is security and collateral, and the best thing that stocks have, which is upside. So you, uh, they're typically structured in the form of a bond that the holder of the bond can use to exchange it for stocks at some point in time. Uh, usually, I mean, they can be done as bonds, convertible bonds. They can be done as convertible preferred stocks or the other types of legal names for this, but they basically amount to a loan that you can convert into stock. And I'm going to use an example of that. I'm going to use a trait. As, as I like to explain these things with actual traits, not in abstract terms. So here we have an example of a convertible bond. It sells at $80. That's a 20% discount. That already gives you an idea that this company doesn't have very good credit. It has uh, shares, stocks trading at $7. And the bond has a convertibility feature that you can change it into 10 stocks at any time. Okay, I'm going to assume that the bond has a coupon payment of $4 and that interest rates are at 4%. So in this situation, what can we do? You can say, oh, I'm going to buy the bond 
and I'm going to hope the company does better, and then the $80 will become 100 I make very good return, I make 20% return, 25% return, and then I collect $4 coupon payments, which is even better, that's great. But what if it doesn't? What if the company does not recover? What if the company goes down? Then you lose, right? So I'm going to do a trade that you will see. I'm going to, I'm going, I'm going to come up with a trade. The trade is this. I'm going to buy a bond, okay? And then I'm going to short sell 10 stocks. Uh, I know this is not a very big risk because the, if the stocks go up, as we will see, I can convert my bond into stocks. So selling the stocks is not bad. And if the company goes down, I lose in my bond, but I make money in my stocks, right? Now, um, because I get eighty, because I get seventy dollars when I short sell my stock, I'm going to invest that in T bills. This is a safe investment, a safe investment, right? And um, that's my that's where my eighty dollars do. Okay, that's my portfolio, eighty dollars, and I have a bond. I have some short stocks and a T bill. Great. Let's say that in a year nothing has changed. The bond is the same, the stocks are the same, my $4 coupon payment is paid, and my T-bill gives me 4% interest rates. I have to pay $3.50 to my broker because interest rates are 4. I'm assuming a 1% charge for my shorts. It's less in practice, but 1% is a round number. So 5% of my $70 is 350 which means I make $3.33. If nothing happens, everything is the same, then I make $3.33. Okay, so like before, is this a good scenario? Is this, do you like this return? You like it? Note that this is not plus interest rates. Interest rates are already built into this, right? So you had a... No, no, no. I'm assuming this. Yeah, it, it, I'm not asking about the scenario. This is my scenario. Okay. The scenario is what it is. I'm saying under this scenario, who likes this? Do you like it? Do you like that $3.33 return? You don't like it. No, I don't like it either. It's basically 4%, right? Which is what I can make by doing something very easy, which is I just buy T bills. I invest the money in a bond and that's what I get. So it doesn't seem to be very good. Does it mean it's a bad trade? No, it just means that under this scenario, this trade is not interesting. So I would do this if something else is what might happen. Let me change scenario. This is the bankruptcy scenario. Let's say that the company goes bankrupt. So my dollar, my, my bond will be, I'm, I'm assuming recovery rate of 50%, so $50. Um, um, and then my short position becomes zero, so I made $70 there. My T-bill is there, my coupon payment is zero, and I make 50% return. Yeah? Is this good? Yeah, this is a good. Well, but then what happens if my company goes um, the opposite? Microsoft comes and buys it for twice the price. What I do, is if the stock goes up by 100%, then what I do is I convert my bond into the stock and then I, it becomes the same as the stock. So these things cancel each other and I lose a little bit of money, but not too much, right? So we've seen three scenarios, three scenarios. I'm gonna continue and now I can do two more. The bond goes up, uh, so down a little bit, the stock goes down a little bit, yeah, no big deal. And then I do another one, which is like that. They go down, so now they go up by a lot or a little bit and so on and so forth. So I have scenarios and I have performance under each of these scenarios. Yeah, in total, I have how many scenarios? I have uh, something like three, five, six, seven, eight scenarios, right? So under eight scenarios, in one of them, I make a lot of money. Under two, I make a little bit of money. Others, I lose. So this is what's called scenario analysis. This is, I've done it with accounting, but you can easily see 
that this could be generated somehow, right? Okay. Um, so what's your, what's your, given everything that I, that I gave you here, what is your sense? What are we doing here? We clearly did not do this trade for this reason. I would argue that what we did here was actually taking a short position on the stock. And the bond was my hedge. If I'm wrong, thinking the company goes bankrupt, then the bond gives me a hedge. You understand what I'm saying? This is, a, we, we talked at the beginning of class today how we could replace a short, which is very risky, by maybe a put. You mentioned that, right? Well, here's another example. Here's a way I can take a short on the stock with a convertible as the hedge. Clearly, this trade, the portfolio manager was thinking that this company is going bankrupt, so it's going to do this trade. Right? So this is important. That means that if you want to bet on a stock going down, you can do that in different ways. You can do that by shorting the stock, which are the risks. You can do that by buying puts, which are typically expensive. Sometimes a trade like this would be more beneficial. How can you tell if this is more beneficial than some other trade? How can you analyze this? Or even how can you build this trade to begin with? Okay, so my question, these rhetorical questions I posed all have to do with portfolio construction, which is how do you, what is your view and how do you build a trade? Okay? Okay, so I'm going to give you something which is a little bit more realistic. A little bit more realistic. To make it more realistic, I'm going to make the math very easy. Once we understand that, then I'll make the math very complicated. And then we'll probably learn something. So this is what I'm going to do now. Let's say that you have a, a the bond, as we did earlier. But now you don't want to bet that the company is going to go bankrupt. You want to do what I call optimizing the trade. Hmm? So I have my stock at uh, today, which is at $7 and $80 for my bond. Yeah. And I'm going to hire someone from APM 466 to tell me three scenarios that might happen. And this person has uh, done some very good work and gave me that they said 33% chance that the bond uh, would go to 100 and the stock will go to 14. So 100% growth on the stock. Yeah. There's a 33% chance that nothing happens. And there's a 33% chance of bankruptcy where the, with a recovery rate of only 30%. You understand? So these are three scenarios that I'm generating. Before I had eight, now I have three. I have three. But now I don't have a portfolio. This is just an analysis of this particular situation. This is what people do. You analyze situations like this. And say, well, three things could happen, and then this is what the outcome would be an, under any one of those events. You can say, well, could something else happen? Yes, of course, something else could happen, but this is not part of my modeling. In my modeling, that's all I do. Right? It takes already to be a genius to come up with something like this, three scenarios, and uh, which are very precise with actual probabilities. So if that's what I have, if I have this analysis here given to me, this is the analysis that's given to me, how do I decide what to do? So this is what I would do. I have, I do the accounting as before. This is my accounting, assuming that, uh, well, this is my accounting today. That's what I, that's the portfolio I built and note that the portfolio I built now has a variable. That's what mathematicians do. I don't know what my trade is going to be. I call it X. And I do accounting, which is dependent on X. You can easily see this being done either on Excel, a bit difficult, right? But you can do this in Python or some other programming language. That should be easy. Huh? Good. So you, you, you know that. That's the portfolio. And then you just do the accounting under each of the three scenarios that we have here. 
and this is the accounting, you see that. The accounting is a function of uh, how many sorts I take. I already know what the scenarios are going to be, so the scenarios would give me the accounting numbers on each of the three scenarios that could happen. My accounting is a function of x. That's what mathematicians do. You can do accounting as a function of a variable or many variables. Yeah? Good. So I have a 33% chance of making that money. I have a 33% chance of, of making that money. And I have a 33% chance of making that money. Now what? Let's, yes? You, maybe you take expected value and you maximize that? Well, you can take the expected value and you can maximize that, but I would not do that. We already, we've learned enough in this course to understand that if you make a decision not taking risk into account, it's probably the wrong decision, right? So uh, it's good thinking, but we need to become a little bit better. We need to take risk into account. So let me do something which is just a little bit better than what you said, and as opposed to maximizing the expected return, let me say I maximize the expected return divided by the volatility. Right? We already know that the sharp ratio is, if it's not related to the portfolio performance, it's related very likely to your income, to how you will be paid, right? So let's say that I, I want to maximize the sharp ratio. And that is something which is very easy to do. In fact, what you have here, here is the, this is the graph of the sub ratio, okay? Uh, this is the sub ratio as a function of x. Here is x, and that's the sub ratio. So clearly I can see that that will be my optimal trade. If this is what would happen, then I should hedge by selling eight, not 10, eight stocks. And that would be my optimal trade from a sharp ratio perspective. See, see that? Justify what I said. The reason why I brought up average is because I, I realized maybe it's not always a good idea to, to show the stocks. If in the first two scenarios, maybe you don't want to show the stocks, right? You show, show when you expect the stock value to go down, right? Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, so I, I was thinking if you, you optimize that problem. And That's great. No, you don't have to justify. It's a good answer, okay? Uh, but again, uh, it's a good answer, but always be very skeptical of trades that do not take risk into account. Right? So I, I'm not saying that this is, you know, the right uh, risk adjusted measure of return, but it's one you can do another. Yes. Can yes, you talk about those, like, because there's always a risk of return you can get. So you always have to kind of keep that in mind. It's not comparing risk to zero. Right, right. So in the second scenario, yeah. you just buy TBX and don't get short. Great. So if you want, maybe what you do is you take the sub ratio here. I want to write it, use a different color. Then you take the sharp ratio minus this the risk rate of return as sharp actually told us to do right that will be another one i'm not telling you which one to use that will be that will be self-evident when you're doing this in a job for example or in a particular situation i just want you to understand the thinking that goes into this and that's how you would do this you can say hey i would like to do more risk analysis i would like to know what is my um, a, a worse loss or my value at risk or what is the, you know, how bad things can get. Yes, you can do that too. I didn't want to be so sophisticated. I just wanted to show you in this context of convertible arbitrage, how you can, from a, um, a single company consideration, how you can build a trade that optimizes something or other. Is that, is that clear? You understand that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Then I have a, st a story to tell you. Um, and this is a story which is real. I have an example here, I think. Um, this is a very famous convertible trade. It's the Citibank convertible trade of 2009. Um, so you, you know what happened in 2009, yes? Uh, 2008 was very bad. We saw Volkswagen earlier today. That badness continued through the beginning of 2009. And in fact, sometime in March, is when the, the S&P touched bottom, it, it actually traded at 666 or something like that, like the number of the devil was, uh, it was very low, very low numbers, uh, 600. <clears throat> and there was one particular stock that that day came under a tremendous amount of pressure, and that was the, the, the Citibank, Citibank stock. 
that by the way that year Citibank was built it's been like that okay that, that was the spelling yeah okay um, and so a, a number of um, uh, I, I, I want to explain something important to you and this has to this, this is finance there's no math here this is finance 2008 was the year when banks, primarily banks, had tremendous difficulty raising assets. They became undercapitalized, taking into account all of the losses they had from the subprime crisis hmm? and other things. It was a very big um, um, set of events. And then the Lehman crisis. So the banks had no money. They, they, they needed to capitalize themselves. And they went to capitalize themselves the way I mentioned earlier that you capitalize yourself. You issue bonds first. And they try to do that. I actually know of a bond that a bank issued with a 25% yield. Interest rates were zero or 1% or very low. 25% yield and no one, was going, no one wanted to buy those bonds. A bond issued by a bank with 25% yield. Go out and find a bond now that gives you even a 10% yield. Right? with rates they were there. Again, so, and, the, and no one wanted to take it. So they started to issue stocks. All the banks were issuing stocks. Thing is that, that when they were issuing stocks, uh, they, they, the, the, stocks uh, the stock market was collapsing. What happens when the stock market is collapsing? To issue stocks and have significant money brought into the organization, you need to issue more and more and more stocks as the stock continues to plummet. Right? So at some point they stopped. Um, shorting. Yeah, sorry, they stopped issuing stocks. And then in, uh, I think it was February, sorry, February, no, I think it was September 18, September 18, 2008, it was a Thursday, the SEC and the FSA, so that's the British and the US regulator, they issued a joint statement preventing shorting financial stocks okay primarily banks i i forgot it was all of the financial no it was just some, the all the banks and some other some other companies and um you would know what happened you would know what happened if i told you that the banks at that point had given up on raising money using bonds and stocks and they were raising money using convertible bonds. Okay, so here's a question for you. And this, this is no math, this is finance, okay? Or even politics. What would happen if banks are trying to raise money from investors with convertible debt and the regulators prevent shorting bank stocks? public policy, what will happen? You can't do convertible arbitrage then? You cannot do convertible arbitrage. No one wanted to buy convertible debt without a hedge. Okay? So then the convertible bond market plummeted. It was it was a disaster. They had to bring, they had to bring it back. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So it is interesting because, um, I mean, I followed the story very closely. I was in the middle of all of that. And I even followed the public perception. The public, the public didn't understand anything of what was happening. Right? Um, investors were ready, were there, ready to buy the convertible debt, but you, they, you need to short some stock. Some, I don't know how much, maybe, maybe a little bit, right? You need to short it, and then they would have become a very good trade. So, anyway, that that was one of those. Say, it was a self-fulfilling a bad prophecy. <laughs> okay, it was it was. It was very bad. Anyway, uh, later that year, uh, in the way that the Federal Reserve Bank decided to bail out Citibank, in particular, I like the Citibank trade because we were in it. I understand this trade very well. Uh, the way that the Citibank trade was, uh, the way Citibank was bailed out is, uh, Citibank issued uh, convertible debt with certain conditions. I have it, have them here. Not too relevant. 
and the government, uh, the Fed was going to be a major purchaser of those securities. A first footnote, uh, the public misunderstood when, when people were saying that the banks were being bailed out. It was understood that Citibank was given money from the Fed, and that never happened. The, the, the Fed bought securities, and you will see how profitable that was. Okay? The Fed just bought securities, they bought convertible bonds. And the, the bank, uh, the Fed bought convertible bonds, but then if the Fed buys convertible bonds, what do you think the investors are going to do? They want to buy the same convertible bonds. At that point, that support of the Fed to Citibank meant that, yes, the bank is likely to survive because this is what government money does to banks. Yes? There was a very famous sentence by Mario Draghi on the other side of the Atlantic in, in Europe when he said, in the, in the heat of the, Euro, uh, the European crisis, that it, he said he was the, um, the treasurer of the uh, European Central Bank, and then he said that he will do whatever it takes, his famous sentence, whatever it takes to save the, and then of course, you, if, if, if the central banker says that they will do whatever it takes, you don't go, you don't bet against that. Well, Actually, you do bet against that, but in a, we know how now, right? Which is you're, you're, a, you're a convertible arbitrage here. What you do is you go to your scenario engine and you adjust the probabilities. That's what you do. So maybe the probability that it go bankrupt now, it goes from 30% to 10%. That's what you do. But you don't assume a 0% probability. That's not taking risk into account. We want to take risk into account, right? So then investors got into this trade, we did too, by going long the bond, but shorting the Citibank stock also. Now I cannot tell you how painful it is to short the stock, which is at $4. Actually the Citibank stock one day closed at 99 cents, which means they would be kicked out of the, of the um, uh, New York Stock Exchange. They don't accept stocks less than a dollar. Okay, they re if they recover the next day. Um, but you see, when you take a, when you hedge your convertible bond with a stock which is very, very low, that short has a lot of risk into it, right? When you do your scenario analysis here, again, that's going to show up there. But it's still recommended that you do some short. At that point, they had removed the restriction. We could short the Citibank stock. And we, that's what we did. We did a trade was we bought the, we bought the bond and we shorted the stock, just as you have seen. And it was a very profitable trade. But who was the one who did the most profitable trade here? Fed. The Fed, exactly. But isn't that unfair? Because they artificially restricted the shorting and then they bought. No, no, the no. The, the shorting, no, well, I mean, the, yeah, <laughs> 2008 was not about fairness. It was something else, it was survival. Uh, but no, they, that had been removed already. That had been removed already. Yeah. I, I don't know what would have happened if the Fed had been the only one to buy the, the bank. Of course, if the bank recovers, that was a phenomenal trade. I don't know how much money the Fed made on this trade, but the Fed, uh, on the entire bailout of the 2008 crisis, the Fed has made a $20 billion profit that no one talks about. Okay. Um, they lost on some trades and they made money on some other trades. The net is at about a $20 billion profit. And of course, the public didn't understand any of that. I don't know what. What's that going to be in returns in percent? Uh, yes, it was, um, I think they spent 400 billion, so about 5%, something like that, around that. And it was 5% made like very quickly. Uh, a lot of that money was, I, I think they, they, they are still selling some of the securities of back then, right? So, I mean, this is 5% over time, but most of that money was recovered very quickly. Like in the case of, I, th I think this year they sold the last of those convertible bonds. I think it was this year. I don't remember. But it, it's very interesting to check this out. If you're interested at some point, you know, it's, um, um, it's interesting to check these numbers and to actually, the, 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 the portfolio of the Fed is public. You can check out uh, their P&L and how much money they gave to whom, when, and this and that. It's very complicated. 
but it is public. You can actually see all of that and you can see how much money they made on every single trade. You can see how much money they made on the Citibank trade. You can see that. I didn't look. I know we made a lot of money and I know they made even more money, right? But goes to show, I hope you understand now how, not only how trading works, but how trading is part of the entire financial market, right? For example, convertible arbitrage in Asia. How would you do convertible arbitrage in Asia? Can you short stocks in Asia? No, you can't. So then convertible arbitrage is purely a speculative uh, investment because you can't short, right? If you could short, and you can short in some places, and if you could short, then very likely the convertible arbitrage market will grow, right? So if, I mean, I, I give you an idea as to how to be smart about this. I think I gave up on, I'm not going to do any more. I'll end up with one comment. For example, I, I just, so you become smart. Let's say that you know a certain country that suddenly is going to allow uh, shorts. I would guess that uh, that is going to make the convertible bond market explode. So look for jobs in convertible bond desks. That's what I would do. And you're, you're just going to sail those winds and, and very likely make a lot of money. You, you understand? So this is not so much about learning how to trade or how to hedge. It's everything. You need to see the entire scope in front of you so you understand how these things work and how to take advantage of that for your own good. All right. I have many more uh, slides. Uh, I don't have time to do anything significant. I do need 10 minutes to, to uh, clean up all of my <laughs> equipment before the next class. Do you have any questions or comments? Do you think these strategies are feasible for ordinary people or do you have to work at a bank or hedge fund to um, well, all right. So again, good question. Uh, so I'll tell you, uh, ordinary people participated in many of these preferred stock issues, some convertible bonds in some countries. Uh, people just bought these uh, convertible bonds because they were sold as safe. So the public did enter into some of these uh, trades already, right? Uh, now that the general public does not have the ability to understand what a short is, how you short, or, or what the optimal short should be given a situation like that. So no, a lot of this is not really for the public, although the public is participating in this typically from a very uh, defenseless uh, point of view, right? Uh, they, a lot of these uh, convertible preferreds, they were sold to the public. Uh, with good marketing and uh, and a lot of people end up uh, giving their money to banks for their rescue. Yeah. Um, could it also be fees? Like until you like invest, until you have like a certain oh. amount of capital, that the fees will be a higher percentage. Of actually, yeah. So I'll I'll actually thank you for that question. I uh, reminds me of something I haven't told you. Um, is related to your question. I actually don't have an answer to your question where the fees were, but I'll tell you in, in our, in our, in this trade, in the convertible, in the Citibank convertible trade, everybody wants, wanted to do this trade and everybody wanted to short Citibank stock. And the short, it was, well, I, I think we shorted at $4. Okay. Very painful. The stock went to 14, right? The, interest rate we paid on the short was a hundred percent. Like everything was bad about that trade. And we were, I mean, we're, we're a big trader, right? We got a, you know, I don't think anybody got a trade, a, a rate as good as we did. A hundred percent. That one percent that I showed you earlier for this trade was a hundred percent. In fact, some people, what they were doing, it was so expensive to short the stock that some people, they ended up doing a short, not on the stock that at some point um, there were not enough shorts for that stock. Uh, it wasn't a short squeeze, but, it, but what they, some people did is they did shorts on the S&P financial index, the XLF. Okay. Just because you, you, it's an imperfect hedge, but it's something, right? Uh, yeah. So no, it's, that was a very, 2008 was, and, and nine was a very interesting year, especially 2008, very, very interesting year. 
Okay, so I think this gives you an overview of uh, trading strategies. Uh, about the questions I got about the assignment number two, um, uh, no, assignment number two, no, the one on credit risk number two. There are some some people have reached out to me. I'll 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 I'll, I'll fix the, the the march. You don't have to worry. Okay, we'll do that later. Now focus on the assignment. Next week I'll give you. Um, there'll be no no math except one equation. I'll show you why I have one equation. I just want to teach you about. Uh, communication skills. Basically, I will, the, the topic of next lecture is to help you get a job. That's the whole point. Okay. We'll do that next Monday. Good. Okay. See you next Monday.